Sometimes we're not aware of how incredible we are. We have all of these qualities, all of these skills, and we don't spend enough time like reflecting or kind of uncovering them. I see a lot of potential in Sri Lanka. I think Sri Lanka is way more than a gorgeous tourist destination. Your biggest asset is your people. It's at that point that I knew that I can truly make things happen. Welcome to another episode of Hatch, uh, where we discuss Sri Lanka's potential to transform from a tribal nation to a startup nation. Today, we're very fortunate to have uh, Igor Denisov Blanc. Um, he is a current MBA candidate at Stanford and also a successful entrepreneur. Um, and more, more interestingly, a past Olympic weightlifter. Um, so he's been touring around Sri Lanka for the past few uh, weeks, I would say. Um, right. um, very looking, looking forward to hearing his perspective, but I thought we'd start with his personal story, which is really, I think, something for our viewers to hear. Um, so if you don't mind, you know, do tell us about your, your personal story, um, you know, coming into entrepreneurship, growing your business, all that stuff, which is it's really good stuff. Absolutely. So firstly, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. And, you know, so far I've loved my experience here in, in Sri Lanka. Um, so in terms of my personal story, um, I'm uh, half Spanish, half Russian. So my mom was Spanish, my dad is Russian, was born in Spain and, uh, you know, grew up between, between, uh, between the two countries. And then I became an entrepreneur quite uh, at a quite young age. Um, actually, I became an entrepreneur at age 14. And um, to do this, I dropped out of middle school in eighth grade. Um, and started my first company. And so the reasons for dropping out, uh, you know, were, you know, basically that's twofold. Uh, firstly, I didn't quite enjoy school that much. And secondly, due to the health situation of one of my family members, um, we needed the additional income. And so I never dropped out knowing I would actually become an, like a successful entrepreneur. I never thought this idea would work. But at least I approached it with the mentality of, of giving it a shot, right? And um, so, yeah, then I, I, I dropped out and I started this, this business, uh, which was in the B2B e-commerce space. And um, this was in 2006, so, and in Spain, so early days of the internet back then. And I saw an opportunity in importing uh, things from China into Spain and selling them to hotels, right? There's... So tourism is a very big sector in in Spain, and there was all of these family-run hotels, which uh, would buy these products from me. And so I remember, you know, it would first start off uh, kind of like having a bunch of boxes laying in my parents' garage. We later expanded into a bigger warehouse, um, you know, which which was in retrospect a bit too big, but you know, I was an ambitious teenager, I suppose. Uh, so yeah, it, it was honestly a great experience, um, you know, n because it taught me that entrepreneurship can support the communities around you, right? Mm -hmm. So I was kind of like making an important contribution to my family's financial situation, but also actually, believe it or not, kind of employing um, people around me in, in 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 helping me with with this journey, and so. I did that for four years. I grew it to about half a million dollars in annual revenues with about 30 to 40 percent uh, gross profit margins. Nice. So, you know, for, for being a teenager, that's that's <laughs> um, that's quite cool. But eventually I started losing my competitive edge in the sense that people I mean, I was basically, um, you know, people kind of caught on to the fact that, hey, China exists. You can buy things from there, sell them in, in, in Spain. And so at that point, um, unfortunately, uh, my, my mother passed and all of it culminated in this a bit of an inflection point where I thought, wow, since my, my business is, is kind of going down or, or slowing down a bit, um, and then with, with the change in my family situation, I figured, okay, well, this has been super um, insightful for me. I would, but I also understood that I could, you know, I had so much more to learn and um you know, I didn't really know what to do. So I sought to get a university degree because I felt like, okay, I need this safety net, right? Which is a university degree in case, um, 
you know, just just to have um, some kind of education, right? Um, in case you know things yeah. things change in the future. I, I just wanted to pause there for a second um, and just go back to what, when you started, right? Um, a lot of entrepreneurs um, before they make their first step are very fearful, and I think um, you kind of just walked into it with almost grace, being young and just like not really knowing any better. Um, yeah. uh, so, do you think? Um, just looking back at your life, if you actually went the typical route, right? Um, would you have Would you have become an entrepreneur? That's a good question. I think I actually come from a family of entrepreneurs. Um, so my grandfather um, sold coffee off of a donkey um, at age eight in Spain, and uh, you know, and then there was the Spanish Civil War, and then he basically started his first company reselling uh bags of like cement he would load them up on, a, on on the tram and move them from one part of the city to the other and you know because this was after the civil war in spain there was a lot of construction going on so that's how he got started um also my dad was an entrepreneur um back in the day so i think that eventually yes i would have become an entrepreneur but it's also something that um you know, I was almost forced into becoming one because of my family situation, right? Um, I'm typically somewhat risk averse, but in, in, in this case, I was like, well, this is, I mean, we basically were at a point where, you know, our family's runway was very short and very limited. And, you know, we had to do something. It's, you know, so I had to either act or, you know, kind of like uh, consider a different path. So in short, I think that, you know, my personal situation kind of pushed me into becoming one. But I would say that the, the learning here is that pretty much most entrepreneurs at some point feel like they don't actually know what they're doing. Like at some point, it's almost like there's this kind of fog of war where they kind of look forward and they can roughly see where they're headed, but it's not entirely clear. And uh, the learning for me here was that, you know, to be comfortable with this uncertainty, you know, to be comfortable with figuring things out as you go, even at a young age, you know, I, I you know, I, because of, uh, because I was 14 and my voice was still not that of a man, I couldn't talk to my customers. Mm -hmm. So that was, um, you know, an interesting thing I had to navigate. <laughs> I couldn't meet with them face to face. Um, but despite this, right, despite all these setbacks in terms of like my age and, you know, my, I guess, um, uh, like other things, I still learn to navigate all of this. Yeah. Do, do you think um, that was a point in your life where you were like, oh my, I've done this and now anything's possible, um, including, you know, going, uh, which, which led to your next step in life, which was getting, um, you know, uh, going directly to university, etc. Do you, do you think that kind of ticked in your brain and sort of like, okay, anything's possible, what the world is, is, I, I can do this kind of thing. Do, 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 I'm just asking you to come back there. Yeah. So I think not entirely. Um, the point where I realized that everything is possible was after, you know, a streak of like two or three of these peak moments in my life where I realized that, wow, I can actually make things happen. Right. The first one, you know, I, I would tell myself, well, maybe this is luck. Maybe this was like this opportunistic kind of wave. Like I, tactical, I, I, right, yeah. right, right. Um, so it was a step in the right direction, but by no means I felt like I was, you know, fully confident that, you know, I, I could, I could make anything happen. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe you can continue with the rest of it. Sure, and I think on that note, um, so we stopped off where, you know, I was 18, uh, my, my business, the, uh, sort of like sales were, were, were going down slowly, and, you know, the change in my, in my family situation prompted me to get a university degree. But, um, you know, if we recall, I had dropped out of eighth grade. So basically, I had eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh, and twelfth grade, so five years left to complete um, and if I had stayed in Europe, um, this would mean that I would uh, need to go to five uh, for five years to adult school in the evening. So I, I wasn't too thrilled about that prospect. And I found a way uh, to navigate this. And I figured out that if I were to apply in, uh, to university in the U.S., um, take this test, which is called the GED, which is like a high school equivalency diploma, and then through some clever 
but fully legal sort of <laughs> pathways, right? I could actually transition into into a four year um, university after just you know like half a year or so. And um, you know, at that point, I also felt like I was in a situation where I could not afford to fail. Similarly to the situation before, right? So I had, you know, picture this move to the States. Um, I had a certain amount of money that I had made with, with my business, but I wasn't sure whether I was smart enough, whether, you know, people were saying, well, university is so tough. You have to study so much. And there I was with like five years less of education than, than the other people around me. So again, I wasn't sure I would make it, but that almost prompted me to work harder because I knew that, you know, there was no going back. Like, this is it, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I have to walk this path and I'll make it work somehow. Um, so, yeah, it, it wasn't easy, but I, I did make it work. I realized, um, you know, that studying was, you know, studying, that so, so, studying something I enjoy was something that I, I could do fairly well. Um, and so then at this point, I became a bit more involved in Olympic weightlifting. So I had started uh, when I was a preteen. Um, and then, you know, during my kind of sort of, um, you know, ages like 11 through 18, I was, you know, training. But it, I only started to like really peak at age like 19, 20, 21, which was in college. Mm -hmm. And so it, it was pretty, pretty tough to juggle, you know, studying in university and then like, you know, um, uh, training because we would have to train like two times a day sometimes. So it, it was intense. But I think that taught me work ethic, um, taught me to listen to myself and to push hard when your body and your mind can afford to and to let go a bit when, when you need some, right? Um, so then after I finished university, I... And, Funnily enough, my major in university was entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. but people would laugh at me. They would tell me, you can't study to be an entrepreneur. And then at some point I was like, okay, they kind of got a point. I'll change it. And so I changed my major to, I think it was like supply chain management and international business, which is also pretty cool. Yeah. But um, it's funny, right? Because even in university, I, had, I still had that like entrepreneurial bug in me, right? Um, so after finishing college, this was 2016, I... Um, and maybe just to put things into perspective, I, you know, graduated at the top of my class from a fairly good undergraduate business program. It was ranked uh, about top 10 in the States. And I graduated without a job. So I went to my graduation without a job, right? So despite my highs, I also want to underscore that there were also many lows throughout my, my journey, right? Mm -hmm. And so luckily I, I signed my, 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 my first job contract, like I think three or five days after graduating, uh, which was a huge relief because otherwise I would need to go back to Europe. Okay. Um, and then I joined DHL, the logistics company. Um, the key reasons there were I speak four languages fluently. And so I wanted to kind of capitalize on that and have a bit of a global career and so DHL, with all their global presence, would allow me to do that. And plus, I had studied supply chain management, um, DHL's logistics. It's, it's very um, well connected. Yeah. Um, so I spent about five to five and a half years there in various roles. Um, the last one being as chief of staff to the CEO of Europe, Middle East and Africa. Super exciting role. Um, I enjoyed my time thoroughly, um, especially because I was there during the COVID vaccine distribution um, period where, you know, we were kind of trying to crack how to distribute all of these vaccines, which at the time required um, a deep freezer. And so at some point we were looking at the map of, of the world and realizing that, well, most of the world, it's physically impossible to distribute vaccines to them because they have no deep freezer capacity, right? So, um, you know, it, it, it was a great time there, but um, while there, I also had the opportunity to spend uh, some time in, in Eastern Europe, um, you know, Ukraine, Belarus. Um, and while there, I, you know, interacted a lot with locals. I speak uh, Russian and um, I would talk to all these, you know, people working in, in, in tech, you know, software engineers, uh, programmers, uh, product managers. And I was always very um, impressed by how smart, driven and hardworking they are. But I was also um, 
I also thought they could be achieving so much more, right? So the environment around them um, was one that was not allowing them to thrive and to prosper. And so that kind of started, um, you know, changing the way I would look at the world. Um, because while I really enjoyed my role at DHL, I also thought that, um, you know, I maybe wanted to, to pivot my career a bit. And so then at some point I, I realized that, well, okay, I think, um, you know, I've, I've, I've learned a lot at DHL, but maybe now is the time to move on. And I wanted to pivot back into becoming an entrepreneur, right? And I, 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 I would see all this potential, all these software engineers in Eastern Europe. And I just knew we, we could, you know, get uh, like a few of them and, and build something and sell it. And I was having that all these switch crazy. switch was still on, right? The hunger. Exactly, exactly. So definitely the hunger. Also like the thrill, right? Mm -hmm. The hunger and the thrill. And um, I'm more driven by, I would say like, you know, creating things, making things happen, right? And kind of lifting those around me in my journey towards uh, towards this, right? Yeah. Um, so then at, at that point in time, I uh, basically, you know, started talking to a few startups, but nobody would take me very seriously because I came from a very big company in a very kind of like corporate headquarter ivory tower role. Um, so then I thought, okay, well, maybe I could get an MBA and that would help me pivot. Mm -hmm. But here, I mean, I was very uh, insecure about or uncertain about which MBA programs would take me because I had this kind of weird story where I'm a middle school dropout and, uh, you know, my grades in undergrad were really good. Um, but then I had to take the GMAT, which is an exam you need to take before applying to business school. And a lot of the GMAT is actually high school math. And it's the high school math. It's the kind of math that you kind of learn. You do the exam and you forget <laughs> two weeks later. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, basically I had to kind of, you know, overcome that challenge of learning all this high school math, um, all these like tricks for the first time sometimes, right, while working. Um, but I would say that I had a lot of uh, conviction around this being the right thing for me. So I wasn't sure that I would make it, but I was sure that I would give it my best shot. And I was laser focused around kind of doing that. So I, I almost kind of put my entire life on hold. Like I would socialize for three hours a week on a Friday or on a Saturday. I would work out for one hour, uh, you know, uh, like three to four times a week. And then the rest of the time was allocated to either uh, basically working, studying or sleeping. And so I, I did that for, for a number of months, which was tough. Um, and then I got uh, a, a fairly good GMAT score. And then that started to build confidence in me, right? And then I started applying to all these business schools. And, um, you know, then, you know, I started getting in. And all of a sudden, I was in the very uh, privileged position of having applied to six business schools and being admitted to every single one of them, which is something that I would have never guessed uh, just like a year and a half before, right? Um, and so then at, at that point, I, um, you know, I knew that, I think it's at that point that I knew that I can truly make things happen, right? Yeah. Um, because if you think about it, you know, all of these six business schools kind of saw things in me that maybe I didn't see in myself to begin with. And in fact, for the longest time, I would hide the fact that I was a middle school dropout. I thought it was something embarrassing. Now I realize that it's actually one of my strongest assets because it's, you know, dropping out of middle school and starting a business teaches you a whole different set of skill sets that is unique and that is very applicable and transferable to becoming an entrepreneur or an employee at an early stage startup, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, it took a lot of self-discovery to reach this point. And the theme I want to convey is that sometimes we're not aware of how incredible we are, right? And we have all of these qualities, all of these skills, and we're, we don't spend enough time like reflecting or kind of uncovering them, right, yeah. if you will. So that's something that I would um, encourage people to, to do a bit more of, right? I mean, 
even if you don't have like big pedigrees in your resume or anything else, I think there is a lot of a lot you can learn from life experiences and how you draw and connect um, on these things can can really kind of build your your your, your brand, if you will. I, I really think uh, it's called the school of hard knocks, right? Like yes, that's that's probably the most important school to to actually study in. Um, so I, I think you know drawing an experience, and um, you've been now in Sri Lanka for the last three weeks, um, mm-hmm. I believe, visiting Sri Lanka all over the other place, um, and you know this entire you know when we look when the outside world looks at Sri Lanka, they see us as probably an underdog. I, I would say as a troubled nation, and we're trying to revive ourselves, and especially Hatch, we're trying to focus on you know reviving it as a startup nation. Right, um, um, and this entire thing of like us not seeing our own possibility. Um, you've been here for three weeks. Yeah. What do you think? What do, What do you see? Um, not only from a tourism perspective, but from a economic, econ- I guess, an economic recovery perspective. As well. mm-hmm. I see a lot of potential in Sri Lanka. I think Sri Lanka is way more than a gorgeous tourist destination you're very lucky to have amazing beaches and nature and and landscapes but i think your biggest asset is your people right um people here are incredibly nice but not just nice also smart and driven and talented and you know perhaps drawing um or circling back to what what i was mentioning earlier maybe um you know Maybe there's a whole theme that because Sri Lanka was never a big player in in, in, in the startup um, ecosystem, maybe because Sri Lanka doesn't have a super developed ecosystem as of now, people think, well, can we actually make it? Is this the right place? Are we good enough? And I think my answer to that is you are absolutely good enough and you absolutely can make it. And I think it's just about giving it a shot many shots actually, and failing is okay, as long as you're always learning, right? Um, I think that there's, you know, um, through interacting with people here, I see that, you know, there is a great combination of camaraderie, of people helping one another. And that's actually something that that, that you folks should really leverage on, right? I think um, as as you grow your ecosystem, it's important to kind of like, help one another to uplift one another one another right rather than having this kind of sharp elbows mentality where i push everyone else down um because frankly i think you know there's there's significant runway left for sri lanka to grow and expand but that's actually one of one of its biggest strengths right that the human capital with the runway with the fact that it's not that big of a country to begin with means you folks are more nimble and can more easily adapt connect with each other and kind of help one another to to grow as a country to kind of promote the, the ecosystem here and uh, you know to make amazing things happen thanks um, I, and, you know I think that point on camaraderie like what you get in Sri Lanka um, we saw it especially when we were going through the uh, financial crisis actually as I mentioned like that road that we we're on the hatch is on. Um, was barricaded in one place, and then we had the president's house with the famous swimming pool on the other. Um, and we were yet at like ninety percent, you know, um, yeah. occupancy because people, entrepreneurs want to learn from entrepreneurs, and that really, actually, in a weird way, strengthened the community that we had. Um, you know, so going through tough times together, I think, makes people um, bond a lot quicker yeah. and bond a lot more, you know, stronger. Um, so we, we've definitely seen that and we've seen that kind of growth in, in, in Hatch and I, I, I think I see what you're saying. Um, and you know, it's, it's great to, it's great to know that, um, you also now are in Silicon Valley, right. Mm-hmm. And, um, I guess that, I guess there's opportunities to connect Silicon Valley to Sri Lanka. Um, and absolutely. I, and I, I might not see all of those things. Um, mm-hmm. but maybe in, in, in just a few words, if you can just say, what, what do you see as potential? possibilities of connecting the two um, ecosystems, if you will. Yeah, so I think there's a significant amount of opportunities, um, you know, between the two ecosystems and and how you can connect those. Um, Probably one that talks about or that is connected more with current events 
and this one may be a bit, a bit a bit out there, right? But I'm always kind of thinking of what's next or what's two or three steps ahead. Is that there is a significant amount of uh, startups in 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 the U.S. and in Europe, which um, unfortunately are going to struggle in the next two to three years, because as funding uh, dries up, um, and they haven't reached profitability yet, um, they're going to f- be faced with a decision of having to close shop, uh, or kind of you know drastically change things. And I think. Actually, if I were an entrepreneur and and you know I was based in in the states and I knew that I needed to pivot, um, and I had you know some amount of money left in 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 my bank account and that would give me X months of runway, um, you know I, w- I would be faced with the decision of well do I close shop now or do I close shop later? The way I would approach it is actually why not um, you know kind of restructure a bit the labor force or the team, move as a founder to a country like Sri Lanka, right? And leverage some of the local talent, pair it up with the knowledge that you have gained as a founder from, you know, the past X number of years that you've been working on this startup, and then kind of try to, from Sri Lanka, pivot into another um, direction. And um, I would say the, the reasoning here is that you know, you you get you would get more extensive runway in Sri Lanka based on kind of like the how the economics would work, and you know it would kind of give you a bit more runway, more breathing space towards really, um, you know, really finding that product market fit, really leveraging that that IP that you have built up over the, the past number of years without having it go to waste, right? So that's maybe one crazy um, idea that I that I could come up with. Um, I would say another way to have the two ecosystems interact would be that, you know, there is a lot of uh, great human capital in Sri Lanka. And, you know, it's often not the top kind of destination when people think about, hey, I need someone who's, you know, skilled in, 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 in this type of engineering or in this type of product management. So I would probably encourage, um, you know, there to be more interaction between the two ecosystems because I think there is, you know, the there's ways you can leverage the human capital here and the camaraderie to support kind of startups in in, in the U.S. or other types of businesses, right? Yeah, I, I think those are great ideas. And um, you know, I mentioned this earlier, um, um, Hatch is always a place for people. Uh, you know, second chances. I I didn't you know I didn't think about second chances in that respect, but that's that's a great idea. Um, and also, just to you know, add to a point, I think um, Sri Lankans um, have shown absolute resilience in the past few years. Yes. Right? Um, um, you know, we had the April bombings, we had you know, um, uh, COVID, we had financial crisis. You know, just been one thing after the other. And what I definitely see in the people here um, is that they've learned to take on like multiple skills uh, as a result because they've had to, right? Like. Um, um, you know, they've had to support the family that, you know, very, you know, very, very the thing. And, and with that, um, I think they're also hungry, which is, yes. which is very, you know, it's, it's fertile ground for innovation. I think. Absolutely. Um, um, and I'd like to say, you know, Sri Lanka is, is, um, for entrepreneurship is, is ground zero because we have so many problems and, you know, the problem, you know, we exist to solve problems. Entrepreneurs exist to solve problems, and this is where you should be. Um, um, so, I, I mean, you know, I, I just like to um, talk a bit about how how you see that hunger in places like Silicon Valley and here. And is there a way for um, us to leverage that hunger somehow to to um, help solve problems at a global scale? Mm-hmm. Um, I think we, we, you know, a lot of our startups are sometimes confused and they, you know, for example, they try to be um, the, um, you know, like the Airbnb of, of Sri Lanka, right? Right. Um, where the scale, the, sc- the scale scope is very limited. Um, but I'd like to, you know, in your travels, have you seen opportunities, what you, what you think that Sri Lanka can kind of solve mm-hmm. and take out into the world that's uniquely Sri Lanka? Um, because I, yeah. This is a very. Um, I mean, you, you don't have to have an answer, but I'm just thinking. Right, have right, you right. seen some? Have you seen some potential, maybe areas or or, or, or something like that? But... Well, I think in general terms, what makes a great founder is not whether they went to one of these fancy universities, 
but rather whether they have the right aptitudes and skills to have to see a business make it through right and some of those skills are funnily enough not learned in university but rather learned through life experiences like dealing with adversity like you know having to juggle many responsibilities and um and uh doing so successfully right and i think as we look over sri lanka's uh recent his- history a lot of sri lankans have had to deal with these things on a day-to-day basis and it's something which maybe they take for granted and they think well you know this is something that everyone does and hence i don't think it's valuable well it is valuable because the resilience you folks have built the you know all, all these different skills that come as a result from 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 your past are not present in founders of other um, parts of the world so i would encourage people in sri lanka to really think about this and you know not sell themselves short for it um in 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 terms of opportunities i would say you know perhaps thinking if i were in 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 their shoes right i would be maybe scared of entering the us market i would think well there's all these smart people that went to all these great universities and they have all these vcs and all this funding right but i th- i would encourage people to look at whether they can take a small part of the of like find a niche market in the states and try to build a product for that market right um you know i think building for the sri lankan market for the sri lankan market is uh potentially a viable strategy but i would also not discard thinking bigger thinking globally from day one right um i think there's enough more than enough talent here to make it happen and you know bootstrapping so basically so like receiving vc funding is not the end be all of of a business you can you can make a successful business that is profitable you know maybe it's not going to be a a mega unicorn but it's still going to be a good business that will enable you to you know employ people that will enable you to to pay the bills to build some wealth and most importantly it will enable the next kind of like small wave of entrepreneurs that using that first smaller businesses and business using that track record can then like move on to the next thing which is going to be a bit bigger right so finding something niche in a market like like the US and building for that market um you know leveraging the tech talent here is is something which if i were um a sri lankan founder that's where i would be kind of fishing for it doesn't need to be anything big not like a huge market just you know something that where i know i can build a product that's good enough get some traction get some revenue get profitable and then start small and then kind of scale it up right okay absolutely great advice um so i, I want to move more to the technology side now um and um i think we had a very brief discussion on quantum computing sure um and uh, i i know you're processing all the um in silicon valley they tend to look you know f- uh, four or five years ahead mm-hmm. um um w- what do you see happening in quantum computing and do you see um you know i think um people are talking a lot about blockchain but blockchain hasn't really um taken off yet do you think quantum comp- once you solve quantum computing um blockchain will become a more um ubiquitous or or do, like tell me your thoughts on mm-hmm. quantum computing Yeah so it's it's interesting I was looking at different reports which showed the growth of quantum computing across like different sectors and basically over the next 5 to 10 years um you know there's going to be something like a 20x growth or something and it's going to go from a very tiny market to a still small one but significantly bigger um I think my my thoughts on that is that you know quantum computing is not at a point yet where we've kind of reached that stability which makes it replicable you can basically um give the same task to seven or 10 different quantum computers and you probably will get different results which is okay right it's it's still a step in the right direction and i think once we crack that problem that's going to unlock a whole new wave of opportunities in in the sense of like to some degree humanity in my humble thought is 
currently constrained by classical computing and the limited computing power we have with like a like a sort of like bit versus qubit um, type of uh, processing capacity, right? In the sense that, you know, we've to some degree reached the architectural limits for processors. And at some point, well, not at some point, we currently have way more data than what we can do with it. And if you look at the amount of data that we generate as, as humanity, uh, so in 2022, we generated more data than all of the data that we generated for the entire history, excuse me, the entire history before, right? Um, so then I'm thinking data uh, generation is increasing exponentially, basically. And once we can, once we have the technology to leverage that data, um, I think that's going to change basically everything. Um, it's hard to predict how will this evolve. Okay. Or when will this will this happen? I think it's you know it's definitely very exciting to be um, to be alive when it, this will finally happen. Um, you know I'm not sure if it's going to be five years or fifty years, yeah. um, but once that happens, I think you know I would say there's it's it's almost hard to like the, the amount of um, different things that are going to change are, are, are almost hard to explain, right? You can, it can be almost, you know, like AI is going to change completely. Yeah. Storage is going to change completely. Yeah. Um, you know, you're going to likely have sensors everywhere gathering data on yeah. all kinds of things. And then eventually, you know, that opens the Pandora's box of like, where does that leave us humans when computers can make better, faster, more informed decisions yeah. than we can? Yeah. So, it's it's a difficult one to predict because um, humans aren't geared to thinking exponentially, right? Uh, and especially now, as you said, AI and quantum computing and blockchain, those could be three exponential technologies. And where does that go? And how do you apply all those technology? Yeah. So it's 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 impossible to predict. But um, if I was to kind of ask you, um, you know, all those things will kind of lead to singularity. Um, um, uh, any thoughts on, on what's going to be the main driver? Do you think it's quantum computing? Do you think it's AI, like, you know, this, this thing of AI or a mixture of both? Or Well, I'm not sure whether we're ever going to crack quantum computing, right? Because it could also very well be that we just never get there. Okay. Um, but I do think that once we develop some kind of computing technology that allows us to process um, these this vast amount of data that's available out there, that's uh, basically going to be the catalyst for all of these changes. Um, where does that leave blockchain? I mean, it'll, it'll probably have to adapt because basically with a with something like a, like a quantum computer, you could, you know, decrypt basically any encryption. It would, you know, there's going to be a lot of um, a lot of changes on a, on a macro level and arguably the country, the country that kind of leaps ahead in quantum computing <coughs> right, is going to be in a position perhaps where, you know, they have this quantum superiority and can suddenly do things that other countries can't. And that's going to have some interesting, I think, geopolitical implications. And, and hopefully we, um, you know, we have different countries developing this technology par in parallel so that we don't have a situation where one country is mm -hmm. so far ahead of the other one that it kind of overshadows it, and then that has, um, you know, potentially um, undesirable effects for humanity. Um, yeah. So um, yeah, it's yeah, it's it's, it's um, very fascinating to think about. Um, but let's talk about limitations of technology. And um, I think you kind of you know you spoke about ChatGPT. Everyone's talking about ChatGPT these days. Um, but I find that, um, and you know, we were discussing that sometimes the answers that ChatGPT is basically running to average, like running yeah. to um, the center of things, right? Like um, it's not, it's not really, it doesn't take a, a how do you say, um, a, a view on the edge, yeah. right? Um, um, and I think most people don't really understand that. Uh, and they think you know, ChatGPT is gonna solve all these problems. Um, so, I mean, just your thoughts on that and do you think like I, I believe entrepreneurship is still going to be alive. Like you know, you can't 
feed it all your problems and it's going to give you all the answers, mm -hmm. right? Um, because there's a context, there's a place, there's a, and, and entrepreneurship, the creative way of, of human things is, is very valuable. Um, just, just your thoughts on that. Yeah, so I think it's hard to imagine a world where entrepreneurship doesn't exist. You know, entrepreneurship two millennia ago was, you know, kind of like trading, uh, you know, physical goods. And then the whole idea of entrepreneurship being, you know, basically trading information, which, you know, is kind of a bit of an abstract concept was, was not even like information, like digital information, right? Wasn't like someone from, uh, you know, just 100 or 200 years ago wouldn't be able to really understand this. So it's hard to really... Um, you know, basically predict or try to think about how entrepreneurship is going to evolve. How is, is this going to, to be in the future? But I think we're basically going to have to find a way or not find a way. We will adapt to this, right? I don't think it's, it's going to like kill entrepreneurship. It's just going to close some doors and open others, more exciting ones, right? So I think um, I agree that with AI models, you know, ChatGPT especially, um, but anything that um, kind of, you know, trains on a large data set and then kind of gives you gives you um, insights using that is, is going to, by default, I think, drift to to the average of, of kind of like what the data set says. And so that has important implications for, you know, creativity. Um, I think that potentially up until now, we valued to some degree more... Um, answers that were rough or approximately right, like in the right direction, right? So, okay, this is roughly what we're going to do. So now that's, that's not going to be um, something that's going to be like as valued because it's going to be accessible by everyone, right? Everyone is going to be able to put a bunch of parameters into ChatGPT or any other AI model and get a roughly right sense of direction of where to go. So arguably then the skills that are, that could be more in demand would be kind of like, how do you think critically and approach um, problems with a more creative man mindset, right? Um, creativity, maybe not just in terms of like, like more so like practical creativity, right? Yeah. How do we think outside of the box? How do we leverage chat GPT for certain things? But then also not forget to still be using our own um, kind of like capabilities to kind of like evolve this further, think um, think differently and whatnot. And so it's it's hard to um, you know I haven't thought about it extensively in terms of how one could prepare themselves for this. But I I think it's it's going to be definitely a bit of a of a pivot in in the skills that are valued in a in a, in a business setting. Um, your has been a fascinating conversation, and um, I'm I'm sure we're going to hear more from you. And uh, as you become successful and um, on your next round uh, um, of entrepreneurship, um, we'd love to keep in touch and hope you have Sri Lanka in mind uh, on your entrepreneurial journey. And we thank you so much for coming down and, and taking this time with us. Thanks. Absolutely, thank you so much. It's thank been you. a pleasure. Thank you.